All right, folks, today I want to do something that I don't normally do, which is watch a YouTube video while commenting on it. This is one that's been around for a long time. That says here was uploaded in 2012. I'm pretty sure I remember seeing it before that. I think I saw it a couple of years earlier than that. So this has been around for quite a long time. It's got over 2.3 million views at this point, and it's titled Sword Fighting As It Was for the Vikings. Now before I start it, I just want to briefly explain why I think that's a terrible title. Of course, always using 100% accurate video titles and nuance and everything is a good way to not get a lot of views in general, so you always have to make things a little more sensationalist to catch people's attention. But the issue here is that we just don't really know. The honest answer is we can speculate, we have some ideas, but it's there's, there's a lot of uncertainties because we do not have fighting manuals like we have from the high and late middle ages. And we, we just have some descriptions of fighting in the old Norse sagas, which are for storytelling, not instructional, and uh, they have a lot of artistic freedom in them, all of that, and there's, there's really no direct first-hand sources. We can, of course, try to construct or reconstruct a quote-unquote Viking martial arts system, but the problem with that is you can come up with a number of systems that and, and lots of techniques that are perfectly viable and practical and everything, but that doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. It doesn't mean that's the way they do it, did it back then, and also there's always a chance of regional variation, etc. Anyway, Kelly Longbow and his son Garnet are professional fight choreographers. There's... So, fight choreographers, that's of course important to note here. It's not the same as HEMA practitioners, for example. Our techniques are fighting based on hit the enemy. Damn, I thought it was based on getting hit. I, I think I may have done this entire thing wrong altogether all this time. <laughs> if I poke any fun at anything they say is just meant in a light-hearted way. I'm not here to roast those guys, especially considering that, again, this is a very old video. It's been a long time since this was recorded, so they may have completely different views at this point, if they even do it anymore. I mean, my views right now are very, very different compared to what they were in 2012 with regards to martial arts and swords and everything, so learned a lot since then, I would assume they have too. It's not like uh, stage fighting, where you're standing out of distance and out of range. This is why we use these dull swords. Yeah, that's a good point. Man, if you actually do full contact, you have to use different swords. If you ever see stage combat swords on Call of Athena or elsewhere, and I'm thinking about getting one of those for Hema practice, don't. They're not designed for that. They typically have fairly rigid blades, whereas in martial arts practice you want more flexible ones, and uh, the, the edges are usually not quite as safe. Sometimes they are a little too narrow, and quite often they have points, which is what you absolutely don't want. So, like he says here, points definitely need to be rounded, and they need to be safe. No point, and it's two millimeters wide. You can't injure somebody. I have to disagree with that. You can very much injure somebody with those. Of course, just from the blunt impact. But, you know, I, I, I get his point. It's just nitpicking. He just means that you cannot cut them wide open. So the striking areas are the shoulder, the upper arms, the shoulders, the torso, and up the upper legs to the knee. This is another issue because this is uh, choreography. Certain targets are excluded, like the head, the calves, and uh, you know, for safety, when not using helmets, even though these guys are using helmets, but um, you do need full face protection, ideally a mesh, you know, steel wire mesh, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, they, they have to make certain compromises to stay safe with the equipment that they use. But then to say that Vikings fought that way is just... Uh, that, that irks me. Because, of course, the, the head was a target in 
actual combat back then uh, even though they, they used helmets you can you can still strike a helmet hard and still cause some damage potential con concussion things like that the neck of course would also be a target calf definitely is a target especially under the shield big movement like in hollywood yes that is definitely accurate a lot of uh, a lot of movie choreography involves very large telegraphed movements, which of course helps the audience understand what's going on. You know, if, if you have this this big swing, you, you can you can anticipate the movement, and it's easier to see, especially at 24 FPS. I kind of hate that 24 FPS is still the movie standard, and what is also standard, annoyingly, is constant jump cuts constant perspective shifts to the point where it's hard to even understand what they're doing so yeah there are, there are certain considerations in making choreography that makes it easier to see but there's also very good examples of that being done with historical techniques with realism for example the group at Aurea has put up some really good examples of that i don't know if, if that's how you pronounce it but i'm assuming it's not adoria or even these silly things like turning around Yes, spin, of course. I can't, I can't. I've uh, ranted a number of times about spinning. Uh, the way it's done, you know, sometimes people point out, well, you, you can do it here and there in, in MMA. Sometimes you see the spinning back fist and the spinning roundhouse kick, blah, blah, whatever. That's done occasionally in unarmed martial arts where you don't, immediately lose a limb or get impaled through the lung or things like that when you make a mistake it's at closer range you're at, at a greater distance with swords so if if you spin around the opponent just is further away has more time to see that and can just immediately cut or thrust to interrupt that it's it's not it's just not a great tactic Overall, it can be done in some situations, like when dealing with multiple opponents. In particular, good footwork with quick spins. That's the other thing. In, in movies, it's done usually pretty slowly. So yeah, I can only agree here. Even go around. So this is Hollywood, and this is not how we fight. It would be silly if we just go straight forward to each other. Because when we do, we can easily just protect ourselves. You go in the in the sword distance. If I hit like this, I won't hit his shoulder. But when I when he have the, the shield at the same height, I just go straight around. Then so this, this seems to be a reference to lateral movement. The shield that his training partner uses there is tiny. Definitely not Viking shield size. This one right here is uh, 80 centimeters in diameter. And uh, the, from what I've read, the smallest ones that you can usually find are 70 centimeters. So it's not much smaller than this. What he has there, that, that looks more like 40, maybe. That looks like about half the diameter than, than you normally have. So this is way more coverage and it would be a lot harder to, to just snipe around that the other problem is he holds it right here right in front of his body that's not how you get the most protection out of a shield there's something that's usually referred to as the cone of defense you can kind of see it with the camera too uh, it distorts perspective a little bit but uh, if i hold the shield right in front of me you can see it, it does cover quite a bit of course just due to the sheer size but if I move it out, I can basically cover a lot more because now you have to get past this barrier in front of me to then step in close enough to reach me with the blade. Whereas here, you can just strike right there on the rim of the shield and this will still hit me. If you strike the rim of the shield here, doesn't bother me at all. And some shields were quite large. One example is 94 centimeters. And I think the, the largest I've read about is 110 
so that's over a meter in diameter. That's that's quite a substantial shield. Body movement will not be the front direction. It was always it is always side steps. Okay, okay, side steps. So he he does mention that they still look pretty static overall. Stepping out laterally or diagonally can cover a lot of distance and can create a very different angle. And also, if you look at that, they get hit quite a bit in between. And that's because of this strike cover with the shield, strike cover with the shield, this sort of action. Um, again, the small shield size definitely contributes to that, but it's something that's really not necessary to do. It's, it's a lot better to hold the shield in front of you and then strike around it. Um, it is it can be difficult, it definitely needs to be practiced, because the shield, of course, is in the way. So you need to strike differently than you normally would. It compromises the angles of attack that you have available, but it keeps you safe. And that's really the important part. You could argue that historical combat should be based less on hit and more on don't get hit, because that is the primary goal here. If both mortally injure one another, everybody loses. And some of the historical masters actually write about that in their manuscripts, mentioning how, uh, you know, young hot-blooded nobles would just get into fights and don't know how to protect themselves properly, with rapier in particular, and then would run each other through, and everybody loses at the end of the, end of the day. Nothing is gained. So defense is, is really crucial here. So there's some good points here, and it definitely looks better than a lot of Hollywood choreography that I've seen. But there are also some issues, especially when trying to portray it as this is how it was, this is how they did it back then. We just can't know for sure. What I've said, for example, in response to this, how it's better to do it this and that way, again, that does not mean they did it this way. It means it's a safer way to do it, it's, it's a more efficient way to do it, but it's not the only way necessarily, and it doesn't mean that they did it back then. But especially also, you have to consider that people didn't always do the best possible thing. Human beings are not and were not 100% rational, so some of the things they did were based on misinformation or superstition or just inexperience, lack of knowledge, lack of whatever, you know, <laughs> there's lots of reasons. Which obviously also means you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. Because in a couple of years I may have different insights, I may disagree with what I'm saying now, I may, there, there may be things that I don't know, in fact there are plenty, there are lots of things that I don't know. So always keep that in mind, always stay critical, you know, Keep an open mind, but also a critical mind. Skeptical. That's really all I'm saying. Anyway, hope you liked this. Hope it wasn't too rambly and uh, incoherent. Thanks for watching. Have a good one, folks.